all its stately airs, London is an extremely difficult place to get around. So naturally, we Londoners, eight millions of us, spend in all years of our lives moving from one part to another. Each of us may say we live in London, at such and such a number of so-and-so street. But during those hours, when we're moving to and fro from office, shop, dockyard, factory, cinema, or public house, this is our address, the headquarters of London Transport. It is from here that a goodly proportion of our day is organized, shunting us to and fro over the tortuous expanse of brick and stone, which is London, the largest city in the world. So we have come to take for granted the bus miles out in the country, the Green Line coach on its long journey into town, the familiar red bus, the tram, the trolley bus, and the train. But no matter how long we have to spend in one vehicle or another, somehow we are never really reconciled to it. We are so impatient to get there quickly, quickly, but always London's higgledy-piggledy shape was the obstacle. And one drastic solution was to bore a new way underneath the old town. Sometimes of the day, it seems that all of us, all eight millions, want to get to the same place at once. It is almost as if London itself tilts and shoots the bulk of its population pell-mell into one small area. And it is this which makes the work which goes on behind the windows of the London Transport Headquarters a most exacting job. For these men, Lord Latham, Lord Ashfield, and the planners who assist them, control something which is not only built of steel, stone, wood, upholstery, but also of that most uncompromising material of all, time. At the consumer end of the organization, the passengers wait in a queue, thinking only of one thing, time. How long shall we have to wait? How long will it take? When shall we get there? There is always new information gathered on the spot information which will help to get us impatient people into tune with the clock. The schedules are constantly being altered, new timetables being made out, keeping us on the move, on time. But a timetable isn't only made out of us plus time, there are others to be considered, the men who have to do the job. Every bus schedule has to consider the driver and the conductor. Can they make it? How long do they take to get through the preliminaries? They're just like you and me. They don't like waiting around, and equally, they don't like being chased off their feet. They like everything to be at hand and in good time. The daily routine of Washing, brushing, and cleaning is essential to a neat timetable. The underground is never deserted. When the lights go on in the tunnel, it means that the electric rail is dead, that the line is safe for the men who work at night to make it safe for us. Cleaning, checking, maintaining are all parts of the timetable. Careful 
overhaul, checking on the innards of all vehicles, lubricates the running of the timetable, keeps it working smoothly according to schedule. How long is the least possible time it takes to clip a ticket? The drivers too have a most thorough training course. Time spent in the school will mean time saved in the future and a safer service. The railway has its classes too. The lid is taken off instruments, revealing the secrets of some ingenious devices. In this case, a safety mechanism by which the train is stopped automatically if it passes a signal set at danger. Automatic 2 is the way the trains change the signals from all clear to danger as they pass by. But not all the signals are worked by the trains themselves. At junctions, the hands of men set the points and regulate the indicators on the platform. those passengers who do not trust the evidence of their eyes, there is word of mouth from a man in uniform. So mishaps on a large scale become impossible, but little difficulties can always arise. When this train stopped unexpectedly in the tunnel, automatically the signal behind it switched to danger and another routine came into action. The mere act of linking the telephone cut off the current. And the driver was able to give his information to the controllers, whose job it is to deal with exceptions to the rule. So long as the timetable works smoothly, these men have little to do. When the exception arises, they snap into action. But a mishap is not the only sort of interference with the timetable. 30,000 people have decided to catch a bus at one time to one place. So the telephones buzz again, keeping contact with the race course. These 30,000 people who will all want to go home at the same time must get away without knocking the daily timetable sideways.
these complications and problems, so difficult of solution, were to one man, whose name was Frank Pick, a great opportunity. He knew that we are impatient to get where we want to go. So he insisted that stations should be designed to keep us on the move as efficiently as the train itself. The entrance, the ticket hall, the ticket machines should be so designed and placed that we are kept steadily and smoothly on the go. It's no accident that stations are good to look at. They're more efficient that way. And how far the very sight of their graceful lines helps the timetable, no one has been able to calculate. But isn't it probable that in these surroundings, the passengers themselves are more efficient? We're probably more efficient too, if we're made more comfortable. The newest idea for comfort is a wider bus being tested now. And this train embodying the results of the latest researches. It is a constant succession of new devices and new problems. The new housing estate demands its bus service. Perhaps the newest problem of all is that we Londoners apparently travel one-fifth more nowadays than before the war, making it more than ever difficult to cope with the 15,000 shop assistants, for instance, who stop work in Oxford Street between half past five and six every evening. A committee of London Transport and the local business houses decides that the solution is by staggering working hours. engineer is constantly being set new problems. One of his latest answers is the long welded rail. The demand for simplicity, greater comfort and less noise leads to a triumph of welding. A rail 300 feet long, five times as long as normal and having only 18 pairs of joints to the mile where there were 88 before. These latest conceptions of design, comfort and efficiency are being shaped into new stations and new extensions. In conclusion, perhaps a few broad figures will help to give an idea of the enormous job of transporting the Londoner there and back again. Here we go then. Area covered, 2,000 square miles. Vehicles in regular use, 11,000. Staff employed, 96,000. Miles covered in one year, 610 million. Passengers carried in one year, 4,300 million. These figures add up to a new London. One that is ever shifting to and fro, under and over the face of the old. Mm -hmm.